to introduce our speaker today, who uh, is a very, very close friend and a remarkable individual as well as doctor, Dr. Medis Sashibor, who was born and raised in Tehran, uh, and then came to the U.S. and trained for the most part at the Cleveland Clinic, where uh, he was a staff. Currently is the director of the cardiovascular center at the University Hospitals in Cleveland, Cleveland Medical Center, the Harrington Heart and Vascular Institute. He's a full professor with over uh, 100 uh, peer-reviewed publications in all the major trials, member and leader in most of the interventional cardiology societies, not only in the U.S. but abroad, and certainly a very important figure in the peripheral vascular disease. He and I share that common interest and that's how we got to know each other uh, several years ago. And uh, I had asked him to come uh, and give us a special lecture and share with us some of his areas of interest. And um, we were fortunate uh, to get him to come. So, Mehdi, uh, please join us. And this is uh, your presentation. Thank you very much, Mehdi. Thank you. Thanks, Carlos. Well, thank you very much, and uh, thank you for having me and uh, making it this morning. I know it's close to the holidays. You could be spending your time uh, shopping and uh, emptying the bank accounts, but instead you're here. Um, you know, it's uh, really an honor to be here. Uh, I was just telling uh, one of the fellows uh, that uh, I applied here for undergrad. They, did, they didn't interview me. I applied here for medical school. They didn't interview me. I applied here for residency, they didn't interview me. I applied here for fellowship, they didn't interview me. At least I made it here. So this is my first time here. And thanks, Carlos, for, get, for getting me to come. <laughs> um, I was, uh, you know, the presentation today is really to get the younger folks excited. Uh, it's kind of uh, to give you a sense as to how I approached a few areas in uh, my field uh, in regards to challenging the dogma. And uh, I'm hoping that before the holidays and the New Year resolution uh, that we're all gonna have, um, you can uh, take something from this uh, lecture home with you uh, in regards to don't ever take things on a face value. Uh, don't ever take anything on face value. Uh, these are my disclosures. So um, as you know, there has been a lot of scrutiny in the field of uh, cardiovascular medicine, especially interventional cardiology. There's a number of papers that have been coming out in regards to appropriate use criteria, uh, in regards to how we should be treating our patients, started with coronary, and now most recently, as you know, in 2018, there was a peripheral artery appropriate use criteria that was uh, published. As you may know that the appropriate use criteria really leverages the guidelines to come up with these recommendations. And these appropriate use criteria actually put us in a lot of uh, challenges because we have to take these recommendations that are made for broad populations and then apply them to the individual patient that we see in our clinic or in the cath lab. And uh, I wanted to focus on three areas to try to show you the challenges between the guidelines, the appropriate use criteria, and what really happens in medicine, what really happens when the patient is sitting in front of you? How do you uh, kind of work around the appropriate use, the guidelines, and the, uh, and the patient that's sitting in front of you? And the three areas I wanted to discuss today, which I've been involved with, is renal denervation, management of severe combined carotid and coronary disease. And lastly, because of Carlos, I knew I had to touch on CLI and limb salvage, kind of highlight uh, some of the challenges related to that. So we have always been taught, and even more intensely a days, that we should take a personalized approach, right? Every patient is different. Medicine is an art. We should try to apply it in a personalized way. Well, it's kind of hard when you're trying to do that when you're dealing with documentations that are made on broad strokes for broad populations, as I mentioned earlier. So let us dive right into it and start with resistant hypertension. Many of you may remember there was a lot of excitement around resistant hypertension about five years ago. Indeed, there were many companies that were developing uh, devices. At the time we wrote this uh, uh, state-of-the-art paper, there were 52 companies out there 
making devices for renal denivation. 52. As you know, the way, just to bring you, if there is anybody here that uh, has not been involved with renal denivation, as you know, there is a communication between the brain and the kidney. There is efferent and afferent communication. The efferent nerves kind of communicate with the kidney in regards to releasing renin, vasoconstriction, absorption of sodium. They also communicate with the blood vessels and the heart, causing LVH, vasoconstriction, hypertension. So there's a lot of efferent communication from the brain to the vascular system and to the kidney. There is also afferent communication back between the kidneys, but also more importantly to the brain. So as many of you may know, the treatment of our hypertension was surgical in the 1950s. And the idea was that if you can interrupt the communication between the brain and the kidney, you can disturb and you can reduce the blood pressure. It turns out the majority of the nerve endings around the kidney artery are located between 0.5 to 1 millimeter from the lumen. So because of this concept and because of the earlier surgical data, a company by the name of Ardian developed a device for renal denivation, basically ablating the nerve endings around the kidney in trying to interrupt the communication between the brain and the kidney, the afferent and the efferent communication. Very novel, very interesting to try to treat hypertension with a device. Well, the first study that was published around this was the Simplicity Hypertension 1. It was a single arm study with 45 patients that were treated, and they also had five controls. Uh, it was a one-year follow-up, and the criteria to get into the study was refractory hypertension, which was defined as being on three medication at high doses, one of them being a diuretic, and the primary efficacy endpoint on the trial was office-based blood pressure. The results were honestly impressive. There was a 27 millimeter reduction in systolic blood pressure at 12 months, and a 12 millimeter reduction in diastolic, and 17 millimeter reduction in diastolic. And then in follow-up in 24 months, there was a 33 millimeter reduction in blood pressure in systolic and 14 in diastolic. Honestly, when this was presented, I remember I was sitting actually at Viva, and this was presented, I was like, oh my God, there is no medication on the planet that can reduce blood pressure by this much. As a matter of fact, if we look at the HOPE trial and the ACE inhibitors, the reduction in blood pressure was about three to four millimeters of mercury, and that had significant impact on hard endpoints such as cardiovascular death, stroke, and myocardial infarction. So actually, I called the CEO of the company because I was like, I need to get to know these guys. And uh, it was pretty impressive to see this much reduction. But many people just saw the headline. And again, I want to emphasize this to the younger folks in the crowd. Many people just saw the headline, including myself at the time, 33 millimeter reduction in systolic, 14 in diastolic. But look at the numbers. We started with 105. At 24 months, we ended up with 11 patients. Now, you may say that sitting in the audience that, oh, this is very obvious. How come people missed it? Wait until I show you how much this company was purchased for. Then a second trial came, Simplicity Hypertension 2. And Simplicity Hypertension 2 was a kind of a randomized trial, not placebo control, but randomized trial. Two arms, uh, one renal denivation, and one was basically medication. Again, six months office-based blood pressure and Lo and behold, look what it showed. A 32 millimeter reduction in systolic blood pressure, a 12 millimeter reduction in diastolic blood pressure, and really, really excited the field. There was so much excitement that most experts that give us advice about our daily practices, like Dr. Oz, Dr. Oz said pressure relief has arrived, <coughs> and my former institution, Cleveland Clinic at the time, named it the number one innovation of the year. So this was, I think, 2012. It was named the number one innovation of the year. Right around this time, Medtronic uh, acquired uh, Ardian for $800 million. $800 million. Remember, I've shown you two studies so far. One was a single arm study with 50 patients. The other one was a randomized trial with 109 patients. And then they decided to do a a 400 million trial to get it approved in the United States. In the meantime, I was working with one of my fellows, uh, Dr. Bunty, uh, 
who had written that state of the art, and we were looking at these papers, and we were like, at this hypertension too, simplicity too, and we were like, some things don't make sense. Look at the discrepancy between the office-based and the home-based blood pressure uh, in, the, in the renal denervation group, 12 millimeters of mercury, but look at the control. Why should there be such a significant variation for the renal denervation group, but yet there is no variation for the control group? And there were a couple other issues about the trial, and we published this letter to the Lancet. He actually published it, submitted the letter to Lancet, and it got published in Lancet. Around the same time, we had an opportunity to write the editorial, and we said, are we really putting the cart before the horse? Two small studies, some of them with only 10, 11 patients left at the end of 12 months, 24 months. Do we really have the answer? In the meantime, if you may recall, renal derivation was being advocated for everything, for resistant hyper, for pulmonary hypertension, for AFib, for ventricular tachycardia, for heart failure. There were paper after paper. Every week you opened one of these our cardiology journals, we would see something on renal denervation. And the limitations were a lot. Honestly, we were like kind of dumbfounded. How can a company acquire, you know, for $800 million, this small startup, and there'd be so much excitement, but there's so many limitations. Small studies, only patients from Europe, not generalizable, <coughs> office space, excluding, you know, more severe uh, patients, advanced patients with chronic kidney disease, and so on and so forth. And what bothered us the most was that, yes, there was a 32 millimeter reduction, but this was only in 49 patients. 49 patients in the treatment group and 51 in the control. But yet, when you listen to folks that talked about this, they would say that there's over 1 billion people out there with hypertension. So I was, as I talked to my fellows and my trainees, I was like, I'm dumbfounded. If there are so many patients, sometimes you're studying something that's rare. So you have a hard time enrolling patients. But when you're studying a condition that there's 1 billion people that could potentially qualify, how can you only have a study with 49 patients? In the midst of all these things, before having any other data, just based on these two trials, consensus documents were coming out. And I think this is my point of my presentation today, is that just because you see a consensus statement or a guideline, and believe me, I've participated in many of these documents, Carlos and many others here probably have participated. Don't take it for an answer, because it doesn't really mean that it's 100% it's, it's correct. And there are many flaws in many of these guidelines that later we learn from. So the point is that there were two statements that were coming up. One of them was an international statement about renal denervation and how it should be used to treat patients. That was published in JAK. And another one was the European guidelines on how to use renal denervation. So we already have guidelines coming out regarding this. And many of you probably know what happened then. Then we had the definitive trial, sham control, appropriately powered, uh, that was published in New England Journal of Medicine. They evaluated 350 patients in the renal denervation arm and 169 in the control with a six months follow-up. The primary efficacy endpoint you may be surprised uh, to see was only five millimeters of mercury reduction in blood pressure with renal denervation. Remember I showed you in the studies that they were reducing by 30, 27 millimeters of mercury, but they only chose five. And the ambulatory blood pressure was only two. The device had to reduce it only by two millimeters of mercury to be considered effective. The primary efficacy, as you may recall, was not significant, so it was not able to reduce the blood pressure by five millimeters of mercury off its base. And it also failed to reduce blood pressure uh, by two millimeters of mercury based on the ambulatory blood pressure. So it was a negative trial. A lot of news came out of this at the time. I commented, I know Carlos commented, others commented about, about this situation. And obviously, right around this time, many companies stopped their research uh, and their activity uh, around renal denervation. As I mentioned to you at the time, there were over 50 companies that were working on renal denervation, 50. Many of them were a startup. And some major companies actually were working on this, such as Covidian, Boston. All of these actually started their work and their research around renal denervation. 
And this was a quote uh, from my former chairman, Steve Nissen, who said that these devices, should, the sale of these devices should be suspended. The interesting component of this was that these devices, as you know, they are available in Europe and in Canada, and maybe even South America. I'm not sure, Carlos, you may know. Uh, but they are not available in the United States. And the reality is that why should there be such a discrepancy in clinical care? How can these devices be approved <coughs> in Europe and not in the United States, in Canada and not the United States? And we have learned many things about them. I mean, this is not a talk about renal derivation. It's more about trying to highlight to you that how an area can be so deceiving at times. And you need to be very careful when you read these guidelines, these appropriate use criteria, and always question uh, what seems to be the truth uh, and try to find uh, the gaps and the holes in what's presented. So we learned many things about renal denovation, but one of the things that's been really hot these days is that actually when we did the renal denovation trial, they encouraged us to stay away from the bifurcations. So the way we were told to do renal denovation was that you stay away from the bifurcation because that may cause stenosis that you should do the denervation in the main renal artery and not near the bifurcation. But research now, again, jumping the gun and trying to do, bring things, devices to the market, research now shows that actually majority of the nerves are at the bifurcation. So if you look at distally, most of the nerves near the lumen are located at the distal part of the artery versus when you look at the proximal portion where we were doing the renal denervation, most of the nerve endings are way out where we may not reach with renal denervation. We may not be able to ablate these with renal denervation. There is also some interesting data out there in regards to ethnicity. As you know, my, many of the studies originated from Europe. Uh, they didn't have African-Americans in them. So that's another point about the renal uh, hypertension 3 that may have resulted it to be negative. The third issue is that maybe resistant hypertension is too advanced. Maybe we're looking at a very advanced stage of hypertension, and we should be looking at earlier stages. And that's where the controversy starts in regards to medication versus devices. Again, I'm, I'm not trying to give a talk on renal denervation. I just wanted to highlight uh, how each of us can take things you know, more seriously and pay attention uh, to the field and not let things pass by, just going with the flow. So never accept anything on face value and always question the status quo. So moving on to the second area, another area where I think that maybe the guidelines missed the boat uh, and gave us maybe not the most evidence-based advice. So this is a patient, 69-year-old with unstable angina who presents and gets a cardiac catheterization. Turns out that the patient has severe left main disease, coronary disease, three-vessel disease. He had previously had an iliac stent and also has severe carotid lesion. He's asymptomatic uh, from his uh, carotid disease, and the question is what to do. What do you do for a patient like this that has combined severe carotid and coronary disease? Now, you may be sitting in the audience and saying, oh my God, this doesn't happen that often. Well, it's not really true. I'm gonna show you the data. Well, it turns out if you go to the guidelines for this patient, this is what the guidelines recommend. This is from 2004, and it hasn't changed. Their recommendation is that CEA plus cabbage for any patient that has symptomatic carotid stenosis, and they consider carotid stenosis as anything over 60%, 60%, or any asymptomatic patient with a stenosis of 80%. So this patient, would, based on the guideline, if you want to follow the guideline, would be recommended to undergo combined CA and cabbage. So the first question is that, is there a high prevalence of this condition? Well, it turns out that it's not that rare. If you look at this data that came from Israel, it shows that for patients with three vessel disease, about 7% uh, of them have severe coronary artery disease. Uh, and if you look at those that have left main disease, about 11% of those patients have severe to total occlusion of the carotids. So 10% prevalence among those that we send to cabbage is not a low number. As a matter of fact, when I started getting interested in this area, I noticed that how many consults we used to get at Cleveland Clinic for this issue of asymptomatic carotid disease needing cabbage. So it's not rare. But the important question is that what's really the risk of a stroke for an asymptomatic patient, asymptomatic patients undergoing cabbage, open heart surgery? Well, it's very interesting. When you look at it, if you have a unilateral severe stenosis 
the risk of a stroke is around two to two and a half percent. If you have bilateral severe stenosis, the risk is around four percent. If you have any occlusion, the risk is a little bit higher, it's around nine to ten percent. So it depends on what the presentation of the patient is. If it's unilateral, it's actually not that high. The risk of a stroke is not that high. But there are many options to treat these kind of patients. And at the time, we were questioning, okay, what, what's the best option? The guideline only recommends CEA plus cabbage, but we knew there were many options for these patients. We could do a hybrid stent and cabbage. We could do a stent followed by cabbage. We could do a combined, which is what the guideline recommends. We could do CEA followed by cabbage, although these patients have severe coronary disease. Can they tolerate undergoing endophorectomy under anesthesia and then getting cabbage? Or should we do cabbage and leave their carotids alone and then deal with it afterwards? They are asymptomatic. So me, I got interested in this and with a couple of my fellows, we started looking at the literature and it was really bothersome, to be honest with you. When we looked at the literature, and there's a lot of small studies. All of them are single centered. As you know, there's no randomized data in this area. We saw something very interesting. We saw that if you went with a combined CA plus cabbage, the risk of death, stroke, and MI was 11%. I don't know about you guys, but you know, if I went to a hospital and they told me my risk for open heart surgery was death, stroke, or MI at 30 days of 11%, I would check out immediately and find another hospital because it's crazy. I think it's crazy in this day and age to undergo cabbage or open heart, isolated elective open heart surgery and have a risk of death, stroke, or MI of 11%. And it turns out that the other approach wasn't any better of doing CA followed by cabbage. That was also around 10%. So then I said, and I'm a little bit biased, I said, how about the stenting? Well, it turns out the stenting is not that much better. If you look at the risk of death, stroke, and MI, in this meta-analysis that looked at all the studies that looked at this, shows that the risk is, again, around 9.4%. The, the risk of death, stroke, and a minor asymptomatic patient we're talking about, undergoing stenting followed by cabbage. So one of those studies actually had come from my own institution. And I knew that we were sending a lot of patients for combined CEA plus cabbage. And honestly, that's how I became interested in this. Because our own data did not support that approach, even though the guidelines suggested that CEA plus cabbage was maybe the best option. So look at this, it's very interesting. So this is CA plus open heart surgery in orange. And I'm not even an author of this. And CAS followed by open heart surgery is shown in yellow. The risk of death, stroke, and MI was 22% at 30 days for the combined approach at Cleveland Clinic. And the risk with a stent was at 11%. It's published data. So I said, you know, this, this cannot, honestly, I, this cannot be. And, you know, we've got to look into this more carefully because something is, it cannot be right. We're sending all these patients for combined procedures. We've got to look at this more carefully. And then I realized that actually there are a lot of vascular surgeons out there that are against this idea, that they strongly recommend against CEA before cabbage or combined with cabbage in asymptomatic patients. And there's a lot of literature out there that shows that a lot of the strokes that happen during cabbage actually are not related to carotid disease. They are related to clamping of the aorta or manipulation of the heart. So we said, you know what? There is a lot of work that's been done, but there's a lot of limitations. One of the main limitations of these uh, um, studies was that was time zero. In my opinion, when you decide, when you have a patient with severe carotid disease and coronary disease, or the patient that needs open heart surgery, Time zero is when you make the decision as to what to do. So I'm going to go for a strategy. My strategy is to put a stent, wait 30 days, and then do open heart surgery. Well, if the patient dies in between, that's the failure of the strategy. So I cannot take my time zero as the time of open heart surgery. And every paper we reviewed was exactly like that. Their time zero was open heart surgery. Meaning that if the patient underwent the strategy of a stent, followed by open heart surgery, or CA followed by open heart surgery, and died or had an MI or had a stroke in between while waiting, that was not accounted for. And that's what made me worried that why combine CA 
and open heart surgery was looking bad because we didn't know what happened to these interval events for those two other strategies where we're doing crowded intervention first and then waiting for open heart surgery. Obviously, these are people with severe three vessel coronary disease needing open heart surgery. So waiting could potentially be hazardous. So that was really my main interest. But also I wanted a larger database and we wanted to do some more sophisticated analyses. And then the ultimately, I felt like 30 day outcome was not enough. We really needed more data beyond 30 days. And this is what we did at Cleveland Clinic. So I went back to the database from 1997 to 2009 and we looked at every patient uh, that had severe carotid disease and underwent open heart surgery. We then divided them into two groups, those that underwent carotid endarthrectomy and those that had stenting. As you may recall, endarthrectomy has two approaches. You can do CEA followed by cabbage, so fix the carotid, bring them back in the same hospitalization or discharge and bring them back and do the cabbage, or do the combined approach, which is what the guidelines recommend. <coughs> Or we could do the stage cast. And at that time, we were doing a lot of carotids at the clinic. Uh, so we would do stenting, do dual antiplatelet therapy for about 30 days, and then bring the patient back for the open heart surgery. But as I mentioned, again, the outcome for us was uh, to look at the, and the way we defined the population, excuse me, was to look <laughs> to see if this was done within 90 days. So in the two stage approaches, we looked at it within 90 days. So if you had stent, and within 90 days, you went for open heart surgery, we consider that as a combined kind of approach. Stent followed by, uh, by open heart surgery. Same thing for, a, uh, for the CEA. And the combined is obviously simultaneous. And again, the key was the primary endpoint of death, stroke, or myocardial infarction, the component of each. But then again, we wanted to take into account the interval events, especially in the two stage approaches. So if any patient died or had a stroke or a MI while waiting to get open heart surgery. And we did a bunch of statistical, novel statistical techniques to try to address this, these interval events. What happened if the patient had a MI and then underwent open heart surgery? How did that impact their outcome? And then also dividing the risk into different uh, phases. The early phase within 30 days, which is what most people study, but also the late phase that we were interested in because we wanted to know how these patients did over time. Why? Because we know that the benefit of treating carotid disease for asymptomatic patients is over years. It's not over 30 days because these are not people that are gonna have a stroke in the next 30 days. So we had 45 patients in the CEA followed by cabbage group and turns out actually three patients died while waiting for their open heart surgery. We had 195 patients that were doing combined. As I said, we were doing a lot of combined at Cleveland Clinic. And we had 104 patients that underwent carotid stenting followed by open heart surgery. Six of those had died in between. So not a minor issue when you're dealing especially with low numbers. These were the baseline characteristics. Interestingly, and this becomes important when I show you the result, the people that underwent uh, carotid stenting actually were much sicker so they had higher likelihood of having prior stroke, higher likelihood of having prior TIA, as you can see, and they were more likely to have had prior carotid revascularization. So much sicker patients underwent carotid stent. And they also underwent more complex open heart procedures. So not only they had more comorbidities related to the carotid disease, those that underwent carotid stenting followed by open heart surgery, they were more likely to not only get cabbage, but also get aortic valve surgery. They were also more likely to require aortic repair compared to those that underwent combined or CA followed by cabbage. So much sicker patients undergoing more complex procedures. And this is what we found. If you compare, so we have two phases. Remember, we have the early phase and the late phase. This is the early phase, 30 days. If you look at the 30 phase, stage cast followed by open heart surgery, <coughs> versus the combined showed no difference in outcome of death, stroke, and myocardial infarction. Stage CEA, so doing the endarthrectomy followed by open heart surgery versus the combined actually did very bad, mainly because of significant number of myocardial infarctions while waiting for the open heart surgery. Stage cast followed by open heart surgery versus the stage C open heart surgery was significantly better Again, because of the myocardial infarction, because CAS obviously, we know, has less 
incidence of myocardial infarction in the perioperative period combined, com, confer, uh, compared to CA that requires general anesthesia to do the carotid and arthrectomy. When we looked at the late phase, that's where really things started showing up. When we looked at the late phase, we showed that CAS followed by open heart surgery, so doing carotid stenting versus combined, had 65% lower relative risk, adjusted lower relative risk, compared to uh, the combined approach. When we looked at stage CA uh, versus combined CA, there was no difference for the late phase because most of the events happened in the early phase. And when we looked at the CAS uh, follow, uh, against ca stage CAS <coughs> versus stage CA, we saw that, again, stage CAS was significantly better than a stage CA, again, because of myocardial infarction. These are people with severe coronary disease requiring open heart surgery. So our conclusion was the outcomes are significantly in favor of stage cast open heart surgery with the caveats. And honestly, this project really changed our practice at Cleveland Clinic. With the caveat that majority of these patients who are asymptomatic actually don't need anything. Don't need to undergo a stenting or combined approach or any kind of a treatment for the carotid. They can safely undergo open heart surgery and then be followed for their carotid disease and then get that treatment as necessary. So we published a bunch of algorithms that eventually came from this work that basically divides the group into two, two areas of interest. So if you have combined carotid and coronary disease, if the patient is symptomatic, depends on the clinical presentation. If they have a stable angina and they have symptomatic carotid disease, you can obviously treat their carotid. You can either do endarthrectomy or CAS. Honestly, most of the time we ended up doing CAS after this publication. We would do carotid stenting. If the patient has acute coronary syndrome, so they have an unstable plaque in the carotid and they have an unstable coronary, we, we recommended uh, stenting for both because we felt that was probably the safest thing to do, to a stent both. <coughs> Versus prior to this work, this patient would have un most likely undergone combined procedure, open endarthrectomy and open cabbage in our own institution. If the patient has asymptomatic carotid disease, we divide it into low risk and high risk, and this is based on our own work and the literature. If the patient is low risk, which is majority of the patients, just send the patient to open heart surgery and then follow them for the carotid disease afterwards. If the patient has high risk features, then majority of those patients underwent carotid artery stenting followed by, uh, followed by uh, uh, open heart surgery or they underwent stenting for both if their coronary disease was unstable. So what are those high-risk features? And this is well documented in the literature. If you have severe asymptomatic bilateral carotid stenosis, but that's a high-risk feature, especially if you're undergoing open heart surgery, anesthesia, hypoperfusion, and those kind of things. If you have unilateral carotid occlusion, I showed you the risk of a stroke. If you have any occlusion, is four times, three times higher than if you just have an asymptomatic severe stenosis on one side. If you have bilateral carotid occlusion, there's not much we can do about that, but it's, it's a high-risk patient. Maybe you want to consider just coronary stenting. This is not maybe a patient that should undergo uh, open-heart surgery, if it's possible. If the patient has that previous history of CVA or TIA, these are high-risk patients. And if they go for combined, they don't do well. And we can use, obviously, some imaging evidence uh, for hypoperfusion. And there is, these are more research-oriented technologies, but there are... Uh, image-guided therapies, again, going back to the personalized approach. We want to take a personalized approach. Every patient is different uh, that we can use to guide our intervention and define high risk versus low risk. So again, um, the guideline only recommends CA plus cabbage. What we found out that actually that was the worst approach, believe it or not, in our own institution and in our own practice. So since the publication of this work and what we've done, uh, actually, uh, very rarely we send patients for combined approach at the clinic. Uh, and majority of the patients actually went for medical therapy for the carotid disease, ended up getting their open heart surgery, and then we dealt with the carotid disease afterwards if they survived their open heart surgery and they recovered from it. But the personal approach, I think, that related to combined carotid and coronary disease, obviously the neurologic symptoms, if the patient is symptomatic, you need to address the carotid disease. You don't want to send somebody with symptomatic carotid disease to open heart surgery. This needs to be addressed. 
Obviously, the local expertise, if you don't have someone that does karate stenting like Carlos does, then, well, maybe karate stenting is not a good idea. Um, High-risk features of the patients, as I described, bilateral occlusion, unilateral occlusion, bilateral severe stenosis, those patients with prior TI stroke, those are high-risk patients. And then, obviously, you can guide the surgeon. You can tell him, listen, maybe you can do this off-pump. Maybe you can use a no-touch technique and not clamp the aorta. Using some of these techniques does decrease the risk of a stroke. And many of these strokes are not actually related to the carotids. They're actually related to other factors during open-heart surgery. So in conclusion, uh, we believe that rarely, if ever, a patient should undergo a combined CA and cabbage. But yet, even as of today, if you get the guidelines, that's what the guidelines recommend for these patients. So I'm going to finish with the last topic. And I had to put something on CLI. Otherwise, Carlos may not invite me again. So, um, um, so hopefully, he enjoys this part. So as you know, in critical limb ischemia, these are patients with wounds and gangrene. And we're trying to save their legs. And we've been very passionate, you know, both of us in this area and trying to do a lot of work in trying to understand this disease better. Uh, you know, we consider critical limb ischemia kind of the end stage of PAD. Uh, I show this slide because there's similar slides that people show for coronary disease, kind of like the stable coronary disease is down here. And then when you get to unstable angina and ST elevation MI, we get up here. So CLI for us is like a non-ST elevation MI. It's the patient that's going to lose their leg if you don't do something. So we take it very seriously. And these are people that have rest pain or they have gangrene or ulcers. So Rutherford class 4, 5, and 6. But again, highlighting the discrepancies with what the guidelines do and what we see in real practice. In the, this is the third area I want to bring to your attention. So just to declare, I was actually part of the guidelines, uh, writing committee of the guidelines. But the guidelines, and especially the previous guideline, this is the updated guidelines, the core element of diagnosing a patient with critical limb ischemia is ABI. It's a class one indication. This is the core diagnostic tool to diagnose someone with CLI. As you know, CLI has two components. One is that the patient has rest pain, ulcer or gangrene. The second is that they have to have ischemia. They have to have arterial ins uh, insufficiency. They have to have PAD. And the way we diagnose PAD is with ABI. So ABI is a central diagnostic tool for diagnosing these patients with critical limb ischemia. And there are other guidelines that similarly, again, the ABI and the ankle pressure have been recommended as a central diagnostic tool for diagnosing this condition. Well, it turns out that there is a problem with this tool. And uh, many patients, in my opinion, have been misdiagnosed because of this limitation of the ABI. And I'd like to bring this to your attention. So we were treating patients like this, like you guys do here. It's an 82-year-old diabetic patient with a charcoal arthropathy that has this full thickness alteration of her foot. So like the guidelines recommend, we did an ABI. And lo and behold, the ABI came back as 0 0.56, which is abnormal. It's a moderate disease. And if we look at the waveform, it's pretty flat. So this is a no-brainer. This patient has PAD. This patient has CLI. So we took this patient to the cath lab, and as you can see, the patient has some inflow disease. There is some popliteal disease here. And then when you get to below the knee, there's supposed to be three arteries below the knee. This is the anterior tibial artery right here. It's very calcified, has some severe stenosis, and it occludes near the ankle. There is a tibioperoneal trunk that's supposed to be here that's occluded. There is a PT that's supposed to be here that's occluded. There is a proneal that's supposed to be here that's occluded. So this is someone that we would say has multi-level disease, somebody that has inflow disease in the pop and has blown knee disease. So we took this patient in to try to help this patient, and we did an intervention on the inflow disease. And uh, at that time, this is a case from 10 years ago, based on the guidelines, we stopped. And we said, we're not going to check the ABI, see what the ABI looks like. So look at the ABI. The ABI did fantastic. It went to 1.12. Remember, the ABI was 0.56 when we diagnosed the patient. The guidelines recommend that if the ABI improves by 0.15%, 15%, that that's a successful revascularization. So we felt great here. We said we doubled the ABI. This patient should do fantastic. So we started treating the patient's wound. 
and we told the patient, stay off your foot because you have charcoal arthropathy and you have this foot, so please stay off your foot. Well, unfortunately, she listened to us and she came back about four weeks later with this wound. And we're like, what happened? She's like, well, Dr. Shishabur, you told me to stay off my foot. I've been sitting in my bed all day long and, uh, you know, staying off my foot. Well, we said, well, do you put something under your leg? She said, no, you never told me to do that. So she ended up getting a pressure ulcer on her heel. So we said, you know what? The ABI has been normal. We know there is a lot of disease below the knee. We know that the posterior tibial is occluded. We know the peroneal is occluded. We know the AT has a lot of disease. But the ABI looks good, so you should heal. It's a pressure ulcer. The blood flow is good. We're going to relieve the pressure, and the patient should do fine. If you relieve the pressure, the patient should do fine. So we followed the patient, and she came back three weeks later, and it looks like this. And we are like, wow, what is going on here? And if you treat this condition, you know, heel ulcers are very dangerous because once you get osteo, patient gets a baloney amputation. If you get an osteomyelitis of a toe, you just lose a toe. You get an osteomyelitis of the heel, you lose your leg. So at this point, we said, now we have delayed the care for four or five months because we were waiting. We thought the ABI looks good. So we took the patient in and we did some of this work, you know, to try to get the blood flow going there, some complex work. And at the end, we were able to create this kind of a blood flow. This is really not important. But the bottom line is that we then took the patient from what she had. It took us 21 weeks and we healed the heel and the distal foot. So the patient healed. But we were seeing a bunch of patients like this, that the ABI looked normal, but yet the patient was not healing. So we said, what is going on? What's the problem with this? So we went back to our database, and we said, what were the proportion of patients that had no straight inline flow to the foot, like the patient I just showed you, that had normal or near normal ABI? And again, with my former fellow, Dr. Bunty, we showed that 29% of our patients 29% of our patients had near normal or normal ABI at the clinic, our own patients, about 140 patients, that had no straight inline flow to the foot. And we were honestly dumbfounded because the ABI is what people use to diagnose PAD. We said maybe this is biased sample, this is from Cleveland Clinic, so let's go to more international sample and see what the data is internationally. So we went to one of these companies and we asked them for their, uh, for their data. They had 400 patients uh, that were studied in this trial for blown knee disease in a setting of CLI. They had cold lab adjudicated angiograms and hemodynamics. And we asked the same exact question. We said, what proportion of patients have no straight inline flow to their foot that have a normal or near normal ABI? And lo and behold, look what we found. 30%, 28% of the patients had either normal ABI, shown in green, or non-compressible ABI. And all, these are patients that had no straight inline flow to the foot. So all three tibials were either occluded or severely diseased. If you went to those that had two vessel disease, because there's a lot of controversy in our field, that if you have actually two arteries, it's better than just having one. Then the rate was around 48%. So a significant one-third of the patients, if they came to you with ulcers or gangrene and you relied on ABI alone, you would miss the diagnosis of PAD because the ABI would either be normal or non-compressible. This work has now been reproduced by others. This is a group from Michigan. Similarly, they showed that 25% of the patient that underwent peripheral vascular intervention for CLI had normal ABI. Only 14% had a severe ABI. And I remember when I was in medical school, they used to tell us, even in residency, honestly, that if the ABI is less than 0.4, it's critical limb ischemia, which is, turns out not to be true. And even the guidelines up to today puts ABI as a central focus. Now, we made some changes in the guidelines to try to emphasize the fact that the ABI can be normal. But again, I want to emphasize to you, just because it's in the guidelines, just because it's in this consensus statement, <coughs> It might, it's not necessarily the truth, but more importantly, it may not apply to your patients. Even though the guidelines are helpful and we should use them and we participate in them, you have to be careful and you have to ask questions that potentially can help us move the field forward. And this led to this point that, you know, how do we even define this condition? Because remember I told you, CLI is defined by the presence of ulcers and gangrene 
plus ischemia. If the tool we are using to diagnose ischemia is wrong one third of the time, then how do we even diagnose this condition? So many of us have been advocating toe pressure, TBI for patients with CLI, although it is not guideline recommended. The guideline recommend doing a toe pressure only when the ABI is non-compressible. They don't recommend doing it in all the patients. So if you have a patient that has a normal ABI, but it's not non-compressible, you may miss it if you don't do a toe pressure or some other modalities such as TCPO2, skin perfusion pressure. And many people actually take patients that should do an angiogram now. They don't even do hemodynamics, which is, I don't agree with. I think we need the hemodynamics, but we need better tools to try to diagnose this condition. And this is, I have two more slides. This is another area that I think has been controversial is that the area of non-compressible, because the guidelines suggest that if the artery is non-compressible, just do a TBI. Well, it turns out that, yes, you can do a TBI, and that's helpful, but this study really opened my own eyes, honestly. I, I didn't expect it to show this uh, colors. I don't know if you've seen this, but so we took patients that had non-compressible arteries and had angiograms. And what we found that 80% of the time, when it says non-compressible, the artery is either occluded or severely stenotic. As a matter of fact, 58% of the time it was occluded in the anterior tibial, 64% in posterior tibial, and the plantar arch was compromised in about 80% or so of the patients when the artery was non-compressible. The way that they assess non-compressibility, as some of you may know, you know, we put a cuff at the ankle, and the, the technician is listening with the Doppler. She raises the cuff with the machine to 250. If she still hears the signal, she says that's non-compressible. If she doesn't hear a signal, then obviously they give you an ABI. Well, if they hear the signal, they assume that the artery is open, but it's just non-compressible. But it turns out you can hear a signal if there's collaterals. And most of the arteries in the foot, they reconstitute via collaterals in the foot. So frequently, we do hear a signal, but it's a collateral signal, but the artery is occluded. So that, again, this one uh, study that we did changed our practice. Honestly, when I see a patient with non-compressible, nine out of 10, if the wound is not healing, I'm doing an angiogram. Because I know that 80% of the time, I'm gonna find an occlusion or a severe stenosis in that patient based on the work that we've done in this area. So in approximately 30% of the patient with CLI, ABI is normal or non-compressible. So you can't just rely on the ABI alone. You need other modalities. In greater than 80% of the times, if you have a non-compressible ABI, the artery is either severely stenotic or occluded. And you may have a low threshold to do an angiogram uh, in these patients if they have persistent ulcer. So once is one size that does not fit all, we need to ask good questions. We need to always question the guidelines, the dogma. And uh, I appreciate uh, your patience and uh, being here and listening to me. Thank you. So, when you say about symptomatic, some physicians that approach has been to do a CT scan to see somebody has had a stroke in the past without having any symptoms. Yes. So, showing an infarct in the brain. Yes. In your study, what do you I place this kind of approach? Yes. Yeah, we found out not only in our study, but also in the literature, that if the patient has had even silent TIA or strokes that you can identify on imaging studies, that's a risk factor for another event. So even if the patient is asymptomatic and you do a CT and you find an old stroke that the patient may not even have known about, that puts the patient at a higher risk. And if in that setting the patient has severe carotid disease, you may need to consider potentially treating that. Uh, because of the high risk nature of the of that uh, the, of the disease of the carotid disease, even though the patient at the present time is asymptomatic. Do you routinely recommend doing that after? No, we don't. Um, we don't routinely do it. Honestly, uh, we don't routinely do a CT of the head for a patient that's asymptomatic. If there is any inclination or any concern, we may do it. But if there is imaging available, then we we take the information in. But we haven't routinely started doing CT of the brain in someone that's asymptomatic.
most of the patients now, if they have asymptomatic carotid disease and it's unilateral, we send for open heart surgery. Uh, we don't treat the carotid. And then we deal with the carotid afterwards, either with a stenting or CA, depending on you know, who sees the patient and what the best approach is for the patient. Any other questions? Yes. So the data that you've shown, thank you for being here, by the way. Thank you. Great in the, uh, the weather. Um, the data you've shown around ABI is, uh, you know, obviously should make us all pause because it uh, um, doesn't appear to be a particularly effective screening tool uh, from, from at least my interpretation. And I think, uh, so the question is, what are the alternatives? Uh, and what are you using um, as it relates to population approaches to evaluate patients at risk? So uh, just, I want to just make sure I'm careful and I present the data correctly. So ABI works very well to diagnose PAD for claudication, for prognostication. So ABI, ABI is a very good tool to use for prognostication. So if you have an abnormal ABI, you have PAD, and your risk of having an event over time is high, uh, CAD risk equivalent. So if you have a patient that you just want to assess their risk, or if you have a patient with claudication, uh, is a very reasonable test to do. Our issue is with CLI. In that population, unfortunately, ABI doesn't do well. And we have tried to translate a tool that works well for uh, epidemiologic studies and for prognostication to an area for diagnostic purposes where it doesn't work, perform well, as I have shown you, one third of the time. So we have uh, limitations uh, and uh, we used other tools that we have, so TBI, is one thing, for example, at our institution, we routinely do TBI on all patients with ulcers. But that's not the standard, and that's not what the guidelines recommend. You only recommend the TBI if the ABI is non-compressible. So the guidelines are unfortunately behind, in my, appro in my opinion, of, in the uh, form of a clinical practice. So TBI is one thing you can use. There are other tools that are cumbersome, but some of us use it more for academic purposes, such as TCPO2, is uh, something that's called the skin perfusion pressure. But the study I showed you from Michigan, I didn't get into it because of time. Uh, what's interesting is that in Michigan, this is a Blue Cross Blue Shield study, and they had about a large number of patients, over uh, 5,000 with CLI. 50% of these patients had no form of ABI or hemodynamic assessment. They had an ulcer, and the operator just took them to the cat lab and did an angiogram. And I think what happens is that when you have tools that are not good, or when we make recommendations around tools that people don't have faith in, then we go to the other extreme, where you know, many patients maybe that don't need an angiogram end up in the cath lab getting an angiogram because folks don't trust the diagnostic tools. So to answer your question, this is an area of research. Uh, I think that there are, uh, this is an area where that we need better tools to be able to diagnose ischemia in patients with CLI uh, because ABI doesn't work very well. TBI, sometimes we cannot do it because the patient has an ulcer in their toe. We cannot even do a TBI in them. Uh, some institutions don't even have TBI. It's not reimbursed. Uh, sometimes the digital orders are also calcified. Um, some of my former fellows have gone to other institutions, and they said they don't even do TBI here. They don't even have the cuff. So, um, and then coming up with maybe easier tools that can help us and help our colleagues in podiatry, in internal medicine and family medicine, to be able to identify these patients sooner so they can come to us sooner for revascularization rather than get to us too late where then they undergo amputation. Yes? So, so one of the things we're doing is we're doing radio tracer-based perfusion. Of That's, right. That's right. And have shown that, that the, the degree of decreased tissue perfusion predicts complication rate and that the changes in perfusion following revascularization predicts amputation and wound healing. So and that's a simple uh, procedure that can be done with existing technology. Yes, yes I, I'm very familiar with that paper, and uh, I loved it. I think that this is the direction we need to go. We really, honestly, I think we have taken a very rudimentary, simple view of CLI and limb ischemia. Not as complex as maybe the coronaries. You know, we have PET scans, we have SPEC, we have MRI. I mean, we are, I think in the coronary, you know, we have really broadened our horizon as to how we treat coronary disease versus in the lower extremity, we felt that just because you bloom or you put a stent, you've done your job. Uh, I honestly didn't get into it, but Carlos knows one of my areas of passion is actually when we do revascularization, we, don't, we improve the blood flow very nominally. 
both by endovascular and surgical approach. And this whole, this whole new concept about angiosome and where you supply the blood, which aligns with the research you have done and Carlos, uh, I think that all of these, I think the direction we need to go. And more importantly, that's the direction we need to go because many of these patients, even despite successful revascularization, don't heal in a timely fashion. Only 30% of the wounds heal within th three months. And as you know, when these patients have ulcers and gangrene, the quality of life, the activity of daily living, the cost to the, to the healthcare system is uh, huge. So if we can come up with novel ways of identifying and improving our approaches, if Carlos is going to spend two hours opening up an artery, if he can know which one to open and how much <coughs> does he need to open it, it may be useful to the patient and may help us heal these wounds faster. So I appreciate your work and I think it's fantastic. Yes. Uh, so I wanted to think about personalized medicine with you and maybe go back to renal denervation, although this may apply to carotid and, and, and peripheral arterial disease as well. So Carlos has taught me that it's probably a subset, maybe even a small subset, but a subset of patients who can get uh, renal denervation who respond very well, yes. and then a subset of that subset where the where the effect is persistent over yes. time. And I don't, as far as I know, we can't predict. We don't know which of those patients it is. There may be some analogies in the chronic limb ischemia yes. field as well. Do you have any thoughts about um, how to get at that individual variability, in particular, how to define individuals who will be very responsive to an invasive yes. technique? Yes. Well, if I had the answer to that, Carlos, I'd be probably either in Cartagena or in San Diego by the beach. It's a great question, and it's the ultimate question. I mean, that's the same issue we have with medications, right? We give, you know, 20 patients, one gets benefit. Uh, even with the best medications we have, like statins, uh, we treat five patients for one benefit. So even the best of the best. So uh, this is the challenge for us. I think in some areas we're making a lot of progress. Um, you know, pharmacogenomics in the medical arena. In, this is our job, I think, the folks that are interested in devices and in the operations and revascularizations, we need to do a better job of honestly exactly what you said. You know, you're right. You know, some patients may need only one of their arteries open. Some may need two of them open. Some may need three open. Some may do much better with the bypass. Others may do better with the stents. We have some general ideas about, you know, based on comorbidities and what we've done in the past. I think, I don't know what you think, but maybe artificial intelligence, maybe some of these newer technologies and IT that's available to us can help us fine tune who we pick. But this is the holy grail in my opinion because we treat everybody the same and again, the guidelines. And we are not personalized. Uh, I hope that in the future we can be better. We have a lot of artificial intelligence. <laughs> <laughs>